Good evening, and thanks for joining tonight's TI Technology webinar hosted by Texas Instruments. For tonight, we're going to take a look at music and math with feelings. My name is Mike Houston, and I'm the moderator for this event. I teach algebra and calculus near Pittsburgh, where I use TI technology to make tough to teach, tough to learn concepts accessible to all my students. So I am excited by, to be joined by our panelist, David Sword. Dave is a math consultant for Wayne Regional Educational Service Agency in Wayne County, Michigan. Since 2009, he has trained and deployed math coaches in priority schools, planned and delivered professional developments, and provided support to 32 school districts and more than 100 public school academies in implementing local, statewide, and national initiatives. Since 2004, Dave's been an adjunct faculty member at Wayne State University in Detroit. And as you'll find out tonight, he's also an accomplished uh, musician and rapper. Dave, thanks for being with us tonight. <laughs> thanks for being here. Looking forward to it. We're expecting a large crowd, so your audio is muted. Feel free to send any questions to Dave using the Q&A window on the right side of your screen. We'll also be using the chat window to send general messages. As a reminder, the session is being recorded and we'll provide a link to the advanced certificate of attendance at the conclusion of the webinar. We hope you don't have any audio issues tonight, but in the event that you do, try selecting Communicate from the very top of the WebEx menu and choose Audio Broadcast. At this time, Dave is going to discuss our agenda. Well, we're going to go through some welcome and introductions. We're going to take a math and musical journey through ancient history. We're going to talk about some songwriting and some math concepts, and we're going to look at the Pythagorean ratios, perfect versus non-perfect musical circles, guitar fret measurement exploration. We're going to look at Fibonacci and do some explorations with uh, his sequence and look at the Euclidean algorithm and talk about some interesting applications from that. So hopefully we'll be able to pack all of that within one hour. <laughs> Shouldn't be a problem, right, Dave? Okay, I can feel it. So Dave, I'm giving you control. Feel free to share your screen. And as Dave is doing that, uh, we do want you to stick around to the end uh, because we're gonna be giving away to one lucky winner, a T-Cube Summer Workshop registration. So Dave, it is all yours. Thank you, Mike. Good, good evening, everyone. Tonight, I wanna talk about music is math with feelings. I wanna start though by giving four, no, five disclaimers, and they are these. Many of the activities that we're gonna talk about tonight were originally intended for quote unquote regular classroom instruction, whatever that means. But I know that we're currently in a different reality. So as much as possible tonight, we're gonna to try to talk about how we can transition these kinds of things into a virtual learning environment. Bad jokes are even worse when you can't see your audience's eyes, and so I apologize in advance for the many bad jokes that you're about to hear over the next short time. In this session, we'll be using both the TI-84 Plus CE and the TI-Inspire CX CAS, but everything we do will be done on any TI-83 or 84 or Inspire. So you don't have to worry about what technology you use. Everything that we do tonight, you can adapt for your own purposes. Having said that, though, uh, this session will not be 60 minutes of using the calculator to explore connections between music and math. It's about music and math. We'll use the calculators, but having said that, though, when we do, we're going to do some really cool stuff with them. So here we go. A year ago at the, at the International Conference uh, in Baltimore, I did a session on uh, music is math with feelings. And it was recorded, and so I provided a link for that uh, session. It was about nine minutes long, and I encourage you to watch that. I checked today, it's had uh, 59 views, and I think 58 of those were by me. So I'm hoping that after tonight we can make it past the 100 mark. But the point I'm making is, if you watch that video, um, it'll sort of give you a, a, a little bit of the next two or three minutes that I'm going to click through really quickly. I started with a reference to the song More Than a Feeling. And by the way, John Schultz, the, the, the originator of the band Boston, 
had a master's degree and a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from MIT. I think he's a guy that had, would have a lot to say about music and math. Having said that, though, I think they got the words wrong on that song because it should have said more than a feeling, math with feelings. And math and music are very much intertwined. Um, I, in the presentation a year ago, I talked about this song a little bit, and I talked about the chorus, uh, the, the chord progression leading into the chorus, and it's very familiar and very catchy. I don't know if you've recognized it right off the bat, but it goes something like this. Okay, one of, the, one of the most famous songs in all of rock music. Most people hear, dum, da, 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 da. Well, I'm the kind of person and I'm the kind of musician that when I hear music, I hear numbers. And so when I hear that chord progression, I hear one, one, slide up to four, six, my minor, five, five, four. What in the heck am I talking about? Well, I do talk about that a lot in the video that I provided a link for, but it's, it's called the chord numbering system. It's based on the C major scale. We build chords on to each of the notes, and you get this chord progression. It's, in, it, it's called the chord numbering system, and the beautiful thing about that is it doesn't matter what key a song is played in. If you know the chord progression, Boston played that chorus in C, and so they're going from G up to C uh, to E minor, D, D, C, and so they've got this nice chord progression, but if you know the chord numbering system, you know you can play any song in any key. But the roots of that can be traced all the way back to Pythagoras and his um, followers. He developed uh, some ratios to define tones, and these are known as the Pythagorean ratios. And the beautiful thing about that is there is a nice connection to a guitar that I love and play. And so you see these Pythagorean ratios arrange themselves onto the key of a guitar. I called Pythagoras the very first guitar rock star, celebrated even by the Donald, Donald Duck in Math Magic Land. But in that presentation, I also made reference to Fibonacci and his famous sequence. And in that presentation, we looked at a keyboard and we talked about how Fibonacci, I don't know what you see when you look at this, but I see two black keys. I see three black keys making up the five accidentals within the eight note scale of the 13 note chromatic scale. There's the Fibonacci sequence on the piano. Every time I look at a piano, I see Fibonacci. So not only is he in the keyboard, he is on the keyboard. And so he's our keyboardist. In that presentation, I also talked about Euclid and Euclid, Euclidean algorithm in a paper that was written by um, Godfrey Toussaint from McGill University. And, Montreal and talked about Euclidean rhythms. And so Euclidean rhythms are used in a lot of music forms. Uh, one, the reference I made in the, in the presentation was Elvis's uh, Hound Dog. You ain't nothing but the, the rhythm behind that is a dotted or a quarter note, dotted quarter, eighth note, quarter tie, and then a quarter note, pretty famous rhythm. And so Euclid, Euclid, um, Pythagoras and Fibonacci were the guys in my band, and so I, I started off that presentation with that reference and led up to the culmination that gets to this, where it's your turn to imagine. Imagine Euclid on drums, Fibonacci on keyboards, Pythagoras on lead guitar, and yours truly out front. I call us the Euclidean Fibonacci Pythagorean Swordplay Band, or EFPSPB, which kind of sounds like F, Pazipaba, F, Pazipaba, F. Got a nice little rhythm going on, and you get out a pen, make a segment of a line now. Don't be afraid. You're about to use your mind. That's okay. If it's not yet clear, we're going to work together, and we'll start right here. Now, scribe another little segment of a line, but it goes right here. Make it just like mine. Connect these two and just hang loose, and then call this the, you got it, hypotenuse. Take the side length here and you call it A and you multiply A times A. Take the side length here and you call it B and you multiply 
B times B. Now you take these two and you add them up, and I'm on a roll, so I won't shut up. There's another side we still can see, the hypotenuse, and we call it C. Now take a look at what we got. We got a right triangle, and it's really hot. Do you see that C? Don't be confused. It's just the length of that hypotenuse. And here's the truth, and it really works. I'm telling the truth because I ain't no jerk. C times C, it equals this. Big shout out to Pythagoras. <laughs> so if I had eye contact with you, we'd be having a moment right now. But hey, let's move on. So I'm... Um, Again, math is, music is math with feelings. So what does this have to do with our classes? And that's what I want to talk about tonight. And so um, what are some ways that we can use these ideas? So it's just some basic things. Songwriting and math concepts. It's something that we can do with kids. I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. Exploring the Pythagorean ratios, I mentioned it earlier. We're going to look at perfect and non-perfect intervals, guitar fret measurement exploration, um, look at Fibonacci. We're going to use the look at the Euclidean algorithm and, and how it relates to uh, a great fundamental question in math. And so, so let's just kind of take a journey and see where it leads. Okay? So songwriting and math content. I gave you the example of the Pythagorean rap. So I'm from the Detroit area. I was born and raised here. And so the way that I shared it with you a moment ago, that's one way to do the song. But being from Detroit near 8 Mile, it's possible that you may have heard this at some point in the past. And that is the wrong thing. How about this? Look, if you had one shot or one opportunity to seize everything you ever wanted in one moment, would you capture it or would you just let it slip? Yo, Will you get out a pen, make a segment of a line now? Don't be afraid. You're about to use your mind. Okay, see, that's another way to do that same rap that I presented to you guys earlier. In fact, I call that one use your stuff. But, you know, you might be a little bit like my mom and dad. My dad came from Pikeville, Kentucky, in the hills of eastern Kentucky. My mom was born and raised in Mineral Bluff, Georgia. And being from the South, they might relate to things like this. yeah -ha! Well, you get out of here and make a segment of a line. Now, don't be afraid. You're about to use your mind. See, it doesn't matter what the music is. If you've got the words, you can make the words fit the music. And that's the cool thing that we can do with our kids. We can let them, we can let them do a variety of different things right? You can even open up the door and say to them, you know, just write a song, put some words down, think of a math concept. There's tons of easy to find background tracks and kids are much better at finding them than we are. So here's the assignment, you know, you let the kids choose some concept. This is something that we can do right now with, with, uh, with, the different kind of, I mean, you have, you, it's a different kind of a learning environment. So give the kids a different kind of an excite, uh, assignment. Let them write a song. I've even, I've even, I've even got a, a, so a song starter here to suggest to you. Maybe, maybe that last song uh, got you going a little bit um, about, uh, you know, the country flair. Well, I call another one as the crow flies. Something along the lines of, well, my name is Al. I got a girl named Belle, and I met her down the street at the corner. So there's my A, B, and the C. And then you talk in the verse about how Al lives on B Street, and, and Belle lives on A Street, and Al's tired of, of going across and up to meet her, and so he wants to meet her as the crow flies. So I call that as the crow flies. And it's just a, a fun little song starter that you give to your kids, or, or you can even give them something like this where you can say, uh,
Well, you can tell by the way I use my chalk, I'm a teaching man, and now it's time to rock. Well, there you go. I call that one stay and derive. So, you know, that's for the, for the calculus class out there. So I'm just saying to you that this is a way that you can use songwriting to give your kids an assignment. And, you know, one thing that I like to think about, too, is, you know, not every kid in your class really loves math, but there's a lot of kids in your class that really love music. And so this is a chance to give them an opportunity to shine in a way that they don't normally shine in your class. Okay, so, so that's one thing that you can consider. So let's take a look at the Pythagorean ratios. In the, in the presentation that I made that I linked to um, last year at the conference, I talked about the Pythagorean ratios that he used to define the tones within songs. Well, in those ratios, two of them, well, three of them, were, were called perfect. The first one, he didn't really call it, a, or we don't really call it a perfect ratio, but I, I, I lump it together with the perfect ratios, and that's uh, the octave, one to two, or a two to one, or any power of two or a power of half. If you take a string, you pluck that string, you'll get a tone. If you cut it in half you'll get, and pluck that, you'll get a tone that's the same, but at a higher octave. So that's... That's a great musical ratio. But there are two other ratios that are called perfect, the fifth and the fourth. The fifth has a ratio of two-thirds or three to two, um, whether going up or down. If, you, if, you, if you're going up, you know, the ratio is three to two. If you're going down, the ratio is two to thirds, but two to three. But if you take two strings that are in a ratio of two to pluck those strings, you'll get a root note and a fifth interval, so you'll get that nice combination between the, uh, the two-thirds and three-halves ratio. The fourth is another perfect ratio, okay? So how does that re ratio relate to music? It relates in terms of two things, the, the frequency ratio and the string length. I'm a guitar player, and so, you know, I, I can tell you that when you slide your hand up on a string, the string length gets shorter and the tone gets higher. So as a length of a string gets shorter, the frequency gets higher. It's an inverse reciprocal relationship between string length and frequency ratio. And so it leads to some perfection. And for the church people out there, it may not be perfect in all of your ways, but perfect in a lot of ways, and we're going to look at some of those tonight. And one way that the fourth and fifth intervals is per are, are considered perfect is this. If you start with that E tone in the middle of those two A's, if you go up a fourth, you get to A. If you go down a fifth, you'll also get to A, but an octave lower. So up a perfect fourth from E is A, down a perfect fifth from E is A. So going up a fourth produces the same tone as going down a fifth an octave apart and vice versa. So up a fifth or of a fourth, sorry, up a fifth is the same as down a fourth. In other words, up and down for both fourth and fifth, you get the same tone, but why? On any instrument, if you start it in E tone, one of the E frequencies is 659.26 hertz. If you go up a perfect fourth interval, you will land at a frequency of 880 hertz, which is an A tone, higher at a frequency ratio of 4 to 3. You can do the math there. 880 divided by 659.26 is a ratio of 4 to 3. Similarly, if you start at that same E at 659 hertz, you go down a perfect fifth, you reach a frequency of 440 hertz, you get to a lower A that is at a frequency ratio of two-thirds. But I want you to notice the two-thirds and the four-thirds. Up an octave, two times the frequency of that two-thirds gets you that four-thirds. Up a perfect fourth is the same 
tone as down a perfect fifth, an octave apart. That's pretty cool. How about on the guitar? Does that same thing hold? Well, on a guitar, the A string, when you play it open, it is an A, but the E note is at the seventh fret on the A string. So let's see what happens on a guitar string. If you were to measure on a guitar from the bridge of the guitar up to the seventh fret, you will have a string length of about 17.019 inches. That's the factory spec specifications. If you went up a perfect fifth in string length, you would go to the open string and find that it's 25.5 inches. Once again, you'll get a lower A at a string ratio of three halves. Let's do the same thing. You start at the same E at the seventh fret. You go down a perfect fourth, which means you get to the 12th fret, 12.75 inches, higher tone, String ratio of three-fourths, oh my goodness, look at the three-fourths and the three-halves ratio. Down an octave is string length times two. That is pretty cool. But this is not just for E and A. It works for E and B just as well. You could use the frequencies for E and B, and the string lengths for E and B, and you'd find that that same perfect fourth, fifth, Frequency and string ratios hold for E and B. That's cool. So in other words, the point is a perfect fifth and a, up a perfect fourth and down a perfect fifth and vice versa will always produce the same tone and octave apart. So how can we bring this into our class? I call it the up-down challenge. Here are the Pythagorean ratios. So a challenge I'm going to give to you, and I'm going to wait about 30 seconds. Can you find another up-down interval pair that behave just like the perfect fifth and perfect fourth? I'm going to pause about 15 seconds, and then I'm going to reveal one answer. I'll let you think about it. See if you can see the math that's going on between these perfect intervals. You already know that the perfect fourth and the perfect fifth give you the same home an octave apart. So I've paused and given you time to reflect. I'm going to give you one solution. Major third, up a major third, and down a minor six. 81 64th ratio. If I go up a major third, I'm going to use the ratio that's higher than one, 81 64th. If I go down a minor six, I'm going to use the ratio 81 128 and I get a tone that is one octave apart, multiple of two. It's pretty cool. So the math challenge and the connection that you see here is find a fraction, find a pair of fractions in which one is twice the reciprocal of the other. And there are several up-down pairs. So there's one way that you can use intervals to bring that into your math class. And the, as a bonus, you'll note that the sum of the half steps that's contained in each pair will always be 12, which is the total number of half steps in the chromatic scale. And the two circled ones, to go from the unison up to a major third, I'm going up four half steps. To go to the minor sixth, I'm going up eight half steps four plus eight is 12. The fourth is five steps. The fifth is seven steps. Again, five plus seven is 12. So another cool math connection to intervals in music. So how's another way that the fourth and fifth are perfect? For those of you who are listening tonight who are musicians, this circle of fifths is something that you've probably seen a thousand times. I'm giving you just the scratching of the surface for the non-musicians. Here are some of the amazingly wonderful ways that we use the circle of fifths in music. If you go clockwise, um, you can, you're going up by fifths. If you're going counterclockwise, you're going up by fourths. So again, you see going up uh, 
uh, takes you from C to G around the circle. Um, infinite loops takes you all the way around, um, brings you back to where you started. Um, you got the C uh, is the major scale that's on the outside of the circle. Inside you have the A minor, which is the relative minor of C. So many musical things going on in the circle of fifths. If you go clockwise, the number of sharps is increasing one, two, three, four, five. Go counterclockwise, the number of flats increasing one, two, three, four, five. So many things, right? So where is the math? How can I bring this into my class? Well, let's take a look at the circle of fifths. This is really cool. If you were to sit down at a piano and you start at the far left and on a low C and you go up one perfect fifth interval, you'll go from C to G. If you continue, you'll go from D to C to, from G to D, from D to A and so on you'll make your way all the way through the keyboard and you will end at the far right at a C. You'll start at a C, you'll end at a C. We saw that in the circle of fifths. But it's not just that, it's really cool. Not only did I go in a circle from C to C, but I also, I, I touched the C note I touched the C-sharp note, which is the next note in the chromatic scale. I touched the D note, which is the next note in the chromatic scale, all in di different octaves, of course. But still, I touched the D-sharp, the E, E-sharp, which is the same as F. I touched the G. I touched the G-sharp, A, A-sharp. B and the C sharp, which is the same as B. So not only did I walk my way through the keyboard from C to C in an infinite loop there, but I touched every single note in the chromatic scale. That's a beautiful thing about the circle of fifths. I wonder if it happens with the circle of fourths. Lo and behold, it does. The same thing happens where I go through a complete cycle from C to C and I touch all of the eight white notes in the main major, uh, the, the white notes in the C major scale and the five black accidental keys that are in the chromatic scale for C major. And so the circle of fourths is also a perfect circle just like the circle of fifths and they show up in our um, magic circles, right? So what about the non-perfect musical circles? For example, the circle of major seconds. Well, the first thing that I would say to the circle of major seconds is pretty, pretty please, don't you ever, ever feel that you're less than something perfect. Sorry. <laughs> but what is the circle of major seconds? Does anything similar happen? This is really, really cool also, because look, I started on the left at a C, and I made it all the way up to a C by jumping a major second jump each time. So I got this nice infinite circle from C to C, but what I didn't do was I didn't touch every note in the chromatic scale. So while the major second makes a perfect circle, I mean, makes a, makes a circle, it's not a perfect circle because it doesn't touch every note. How about the circle of minor thirds? Same thing. Circle of major thirds, same thing. Circle of augmented fourth or diminished fifths, which is the same thing, but I get a, another infinite circle, but I don't touch every note. Circle of minor sixths, another circle from C to C, but I don't touch every note. Circle of major sixths, I'm getting closer. I'm touching five notes, but not quite there yet. How about in the circle of minor sevenths? No, I didn't make it there yet either. But I did an infinite circle, but didn't touch all of the notes. So those are some nice circles, but they're not perfect. So what's going on here? So what's the math? So again, we have a really cool math connection to what's going on in these perfect circles. You'll notice the perfect fourth and the perfect fifth. Each of those have five and seven half steps in their intervals. Interesting about five and seven, 
when you're talking about 12 total steps in a chromatic scale because the non-perfect circles, the major second each step in that circle has two half tones. A minor third has three half tones, a major third four half tones, and so on. What do you notice? And by the way, we didn't talk about the trivial cases, the minor second and the major seventh, because a minor second is only a half step away from C. And if I stepped a half step, of course I'm going to hit every note. So it's a perfect circle, but it's trivial because there's nothing interesting. It hits every note. And same for the major seventh, it's just going down a half step in each one. So not the, not considering the trivial cases, if I look at the perfect circles versus the non-perfect circles, do you see the math connection? I'm sure by now you have. If you haven't, 5 and 7 are relatively primed to 12, whereas the 2, 3, 4, 6, 8, 9, and 10 are not relatively prime. Another fun little mathematical truth behind the musical perfection in the intervals and the circles. So let's go back to the guitar fret exploration. This is a really cool opportunity for us to kind of start looking at the calculators and start doing some measurements and doing an activity. One thing that you can even do with your students during this time when a uh, class is not typical. Now, not everybody has a guitar at home, I understand, um, but um, a lot of people have access to somebody who has a guitar, or they can do some research, or you can do like I did and take some pictures of your guitars. I took pictures of my acoustic, my bass, and my Strat. And so with these pictures then, we can zoom in and get some measurements to collect some data that I'm going to talk about in just a second. So the point is, this is a nice activity for you to give to students where you can collect data and then analyze that data. And then assignment today could be, hey, your job today is to just go make these measurements. Find a guitar or find an internet source that can help you find the measurements of the guitar frets. And what are we measuring? We're measuring the string length that's indicated by the frets on the guitar. In other words, each one of those, for those that don't know what a fret is on a guitar, those vertical, um, uh, right now as we look at this guitar, um, you see the dots on the neck there, but the dots are separated by these vertical bars across the neck of the guitar. Each of those bars is a fret. And when you press the guitar at that fret, the string makes contact there at the fret and it changes the length of each of the strings. And so that's the, that's the math that we want to measure here. And so the activity then is you let the students gather this data. And so what we have then is I have, and this, this by the way, all of the materials that I'm sharing with you are uh, in the package of materials that Mike has made available to you. So you'll be able to get um, the, the, all of the print material here, but this is the data collection sheet for the students. And it tells them what the bridge of the guitar is, what the nut is of the guitar, which in the nut we're calling fret zero, just so that it has a number when we start referring to it in our calculator and collecting and analyzing the data. So you have the students make those measurements from the bridge up to the neck, up to the nut. And, 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 and just so you know, a typical electric guitar, it's 25 and a half inches. So typically they'll start at 25.5 inches or thereabouts. And then they measure the distance from the bridge up to the first fret, bridge up to the second fret, bridge up to the third fret, and they collect that data. That's assignment number one. So now when they come back uh, on the next day, we can start by analyzing the data. And so here, what I've done for you, I'm going to start working today on the 84. So when I took the measurements on my, I, I think this was from my, my electric guitar, my Strat. Um, I'm not an expert measurer, but I can use a ruler and a tape measure, and I got about 26.469. Now, why did I get 26.469? Because I, I rounded it off. I measured it in, 
and sixteenths, and some of them I measured in 30 seconds, but when I rounded off all of those measurements, and here is the data from my strat. So where do we go from here, okay? So what I need is I need to have a list, so I'm gonna use the sequence command, and I'm going to generate a sequence from zero to, I hit the wrong command, sorry, clear. I'm gonna do that again. And I want a sequence to go from zero to 22, I think is what I had. My, I think I have 22 frets on my strat. And so when I do this, now when I look, yes, I have 22 frets on my strat. And so now I have a pair of data. Where do we go from here? Well, typically we want to go to a scatter plot. So if I set up a scatter plot, I like to use what I call, sorry for that, I like to use what I call a zoom stat window strategy. So I'm going to set up a plot to do um, list one and list two for um, my scatter plot. My computer just froze up. Sorry about that, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to go back and share my screen. Okay, I don't know what happened there, but I had a little glitch. But now I'm back on list one where my X's are, list two where my Y's are, and I'm going to hit zoom, and I'm going to go to six, zoom, nine, <laughs> and I get this nice curve. So, again, where do we go here? Of course, of course, you know, I can see that the data is going in a decreasing pattern, um, we can explore, uh, is it linear, is it nonlinear? By my naked eye, I can tell that that's nonlinear. I also know that it's nonlinear. I give you in the resource package here an, uh, a, an, a detailed step-by-step, -step, sort of almost like a script of a way that you can kind of walk through this here. Um, to, to, to verify that it's not linear. Um, and I can tell by looking that it's not linear, but it's nice to actually go through this, the process with the students that I know in a nonlinear situation, first differences are, con I mean, in a linear situation, first differences are constant. If I use the stat command first differences here, where I look at the delta list of L2, I can see that the first differences of my fret lengths are not constant. And so clearly the data is not linear. I can go to L4, look at the second differences and see that it's not quadratic as well. So then what is it? So we have to talk about a different kind of change with the students. So there's a couple of ways to do this and a lot of ways in fact, you know, I know the temptation for many of us is right here just to immediately to go to an exponential regression because that's what it looks like, right? But let's, let's hold off on that for a minute and let's explore and say there's a different kind of change going on with exponential functions. A minute ago when we did the consecutive differences here, we were basically taking the 24 minus 25.469. I could right here in this cell type 24 minus 25.469 and get that same difference that I had a moment ago. But since I know it's not differences, I want to do something different. Ha, there's a pun. Um, so what, what can I do instead? So when another thing that I can do besides differences, how about if I try dividing. What if I take instead of 24 minus 25.49, what if I took 24 divided by 
0.469. What happens there? I get a, I get a number. Okay. Well, let's look at the next ratio, 22.656 divided by 24. What do I get there? Oh, my goodness. Are you kidding me? 21.375 divided by 22.656. Look at those numbers. Those ratios right there are so close. That is beautiful. That's amazing. That's why I love this activity. Because what I'm doing is I'm allowing my students to discover the idea that in exponential functions, the ratio of terms is constant rather than the difference of the terms being constant. Call it the common ratio. In fact, we can do a really cool command to calculate the ratios of all of those cells by just saying, let me do another sequence. But this time, before I do that, let me do what I would do with my students first. I'm going to go back here to stat edit. I can say another way that I could have done that calculation is this number right there, that 24, look down at the bottom of the screen. It's list two, number two, the item two in list two. That 25.469 is list two, item one. Right over here, I could have typed second list two, item two, divided by second list two, item one. I'll, let, I'll pause and let you take a moment to look at that notation at the bottom of the screen. What I'm saying is, I hope you can see my cursor. I'm saying take this 24, which is L2 item one, and divide by 25.469, which is L2 item one. When I do that division, that's how I get that 9.9423. The cool thing about doing that is it sets me up for the sequence command that I'm going to do here. So I'm going to do the sequence command in a cool way. I'm going to say the sequence of the list item that's not the first item, but the second item, the x plus 1 item. And I'm going to divide that by the list to first item. Look at that notation. That's pretty cool. So I'm going to take list to the, sec the, the next item and divide it by list to the previous item. And I'm going to go from x starting at 0 all the way up to 22. How about if I start at 1 because there is no L2, 0, there's an L2, 1, and I know that there is a 20-second fret, but there are only 23, 21 ratios. So I'm going to go 21 so that I don't get too many ratios and get an error message. And so now when I press Enter, I got an error message because I had an item in my list, sorry. Um, clear that item, delete that item, Enter. clear, clear, enter. Now when I do the list operation, which is stored by the way, which is nice that it was stored, I'm going to paste that. into the right place. Yes, I'm a professional. <laughs> I told you some bad, there were going to be a lot of bad jokes tonight. So there was another one. How about if I get to the top of the list, where I, in the, uh, the command line for the list, and let me enter the command there. Thank you for your patience. And so when I do the sequence here, I get all of those ratios. That's really cool. And so I have one less ratio than I have number of items. And if I 
exit this screen, what if I took the average of all of those ratios? I'm going to find the mean of L3. I'm going to take the mean of L3. And that's the average ratio, about 0.436. I'm going to store that into B. Alpha. There's a reason why I'm going to do that. Because I'm going to go to my graph again. And if I go to Y equals, I know my fret length started at 25.5. But I'm going to multiply times B to the X power. And oh my word, I manually calculated a regression equation that matches my data set. And I didn't do an exponential reg regression. I discovered the exponential regression for that model. I explain that in detail, how you can walk through that conversation with your students in one of the handouts that I give you in this package. I encourage you to look that over because the way that we go through that journey is a really, really, really rich journey that was, that was connected to our love of, ma of, of music. So we take our love of music and we, we do a data analysis and um, we use it to discover the way exponential functions behave in a really, really cool way. The final punchline for this is a couple final punchlines. I like to use for linear regressions the y equals a plus bx form. I know that we're so used to mx plus b. A plus bx form for many of us is uncomfortable, but what's nice about a plus bx is two things. Reason number one, kids often find it more comfortable to think of something that they're starting with and then they're adding the repeated change over and over again. So like you start with your y-intercept and then you're adding repeatedly or subtracting repeatedly with your, with your linear change. So a plus bx is a nice way of thinking about linear functions and it's nice intuitive as well. What's also nice about it is it really connects well to exponential functions being a times b to the x. So if I had taught this lesson and focused on a linear approximation using a plus bx, and then it would, it would make the transition to a times b to the x a lot more seamless. Also now, notice that the way that we can actually find the, the real true dimensions, um, other than... Because the Pythagorean ratios, by the way, he had irrational fears, him and his followers. Um, that's another bad pun, by the way. Um, he had irrational fears. Um, he thought everything was rational, and so he used rational approximations for all of these ratios. We know now that they're not really rational. They're exponential. Why is that? Because I'm taking a, a, a common ratio and multiplying term by term, starting with the one at the at the un at the at the root note, and when I multiply that common ratio twelve times, I get to the half string length or the half interval, which is the octave. So I'm multiplying x to the twelfth power times one to get one half or the 12th root of x, and look at what the 12th root of x is, 0.943874. And when we go down and we look at our mean of L3, the 12th root of um, 1 half x is really close to what we found in this data measurement exploration. It's really cool when real world data um, that we measure really, really, really closely aligns with the true uh, mathematical model for that, for that scenario. So that's the guitar fret measurement exploration. We've got a few more things to look at in the time that remains, and I know our time is short, but what, 
we talked about Fibonacci earlier, how he's in the keyboard. And so, you know, a nice thing that you can do now with kids is give them an assignment. Go find Fibonacci out in the yard. Go take pictures of ones, twos, threes, fives, eights, and thirteens. And, or, or do some research and find some situations where you can take some measurements of your, of your, of your body to, to find Fibonacci. Um, Fibonacci is all over the place. And so there's lots of fun things that students can do related to the Fibonacci sequence. But we can also um, look back to music. And there's a, a band called Tool that years ago, they released a song called Lateralis, which is really amazingly cool. And there are some really cool videos that talk about the use of mathematics that the that the band used to create this song. I just want to share one with you really quick, the lyrics of the first verse. I call it a haiku nachi because it's not a haiku, but it uses the Fibonacci sequence of one, one, two, three, five, eight, and five, three in the lyrics of the song, black, then, white are all I see in my infancy, red and yellow then came to me reaching out to me, lets me see. So it's a cool thing to do with your students. Ask them to write a haiku, right? Ask them to write a haiku nachi um, that teaches a math concept. Just a fun little diversion to help get through these crazy times that we're in. So how can we do the Fibonacci sequence on the calculator? Well, um, this is kind of cool too. And I know we've only got a couple of minutes, but I'm going to go back to my calculator. And I know those of you that have Inspires, you might feel a little jealous because I haven't done much with the Inspires. I did give you a bunch of Inspire files just so that you know that they're there. Um, I just want to point them out to you. You've got some cool uh, Fibonacci, I mean, some Pythagorean ratio explorations with the Inspire files that I'm giving you. But you can also, you can do the Fibonacci sequence really quick and easy. Um, on the Inspire, you can even do it on the 84, which I'll do in just a second. So we'll do the Inspire. I'm going to add a Listen Spreadsheets page. I just get my two starters, a one and a one. Well, what do I do? I fill down. Menu. Um, sorry, no, I'm going to do it this way. Equals um, A1 plus A2. There we go. And now fill that down. And so there we go. I've got the Fibonacci sequence. That's kind of cool. And, and the beautiful thing about the Fibonacci sequence is similar to the exponential. We get a nice ratio situation equals A2 divided by A1. If I fill that down, I get a really cool thing happens with the Fibonacci sequence that it approaches the gold, whoops, approximate. The, I get... Uh, approaches the golden ratio, which is really, really cool. So the Fibonacci sequence can be used on the calculator to show how it approaches the golden ratio. In fact, that's um, sometimes a little bit hard to do on the 84, but it can do, be done on the 84 as well. I'm going to go to Stat Edit, and here in List 4, I'm just going to say 1, 1, 2, 3, whoops, Two, three, five, eight, thirteen. And this is a good practice for the kids doing their computation. Thirty-four. And then eventually if they want to, they can just say thirty-four plus twenty-one. So they can get the Fibonacci sequence that way by just adding. And then they can come over here and do a similar sequence like we did earlier of the Lx plus 1 divided by Lx, and they'll get a sequence in here of decimals that approach the golden ratio. So another way to explore the Fibonacci sequence on the 84. So we're, I, I'm watching our clock, and we're getting very close to the end. So I don't want to leave Euclid out. One of the cool things about Euclid is it's based on the division algorithm. I put it in here for you to see. And, you know, I know that the Euclidean algorithm, I mean, the division algorithm tells us that something like 11 divided by 4, and sim we're used to writing it as 2 and 3 fourths, but it can be written as 4, as, as um, 1 and 7 fourths. 
So it's not wrong that it's one and seven fourths. A nice way to make a nice extension is 0.9 repeating. It's one of the most famous questions in math. We teachers know that they're equal. Students don't, and they find it very troubling when you try to tell them that it is equal. But what's nice about um, the division algorithm, I can take something like um, one, I, one divided by one, one divided by one, I know if I wrote it in long division, I want you to just try to visualize this, if you will, one divided by one in long division, I know is one. But what if I did one divided by one in long division and I put a zero above the one and then put a decimal point to the right of the zero and put a decimal point to the right of the one inside the division bar. So I have 1.0 divided by one and I get zero point. Well, then you can show that it's nine, 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 cool. And it's, it's just a cool way and a cool connection to the Euclidean algorithm, which is based on the division algorithm. And so I can explore one of these really powerful questions that kids really find unbelievable that 0.9 repeating is really equal to one. So as a closure here really quick, I've included in the PowerPoint that you're gonna get some supporting um, links. Um, the YouTube link at the, the first YouTube link at the bottom is one by Vi Hart. I don't know if you've ever heard of Vi Hart, but she does one on 0.9 repeating. It's well worth watching, I promise. So I highly recommend that one. But all of these links in here are really good and they relate to a lot of the things that we've talked about. And so with just the few minutes that remain, I think it's about time for me now to turn it back over to Mike. Mike, I'm going to release my control back to you. I'm going to stop sharing. Uh, and I'm going to relinquish control back to you, Mike. And there you go. It's all yours, bud. Thanks so much, Dave. So we're excited that uh, we have some T-Cube Summer Workshops that are hopefully coming to an area near you. Uh, we also have some T-Cube Summer Workshops that can be attended virtually. Please visit our website to learn a little more, uh, education.ti.com forward slash T3 Summer Workshops. Uh, but as we mentioned at the beginning, uh, we're giving away to one lucky winner a free T-Cube Summer Workshop registration. And tonight's lucky winner is Laura Pisey. So Laura, congratulations. We really hope to see you as a, at a T-Cube Summer Workshop, and we'll be in touch over email in the next couple of days. To receive a certificate of attendance, go and click the link in the chat window. Also listed as a link for the documents that Dave used tonight as well. And if you're watching this on demand, go ahead and copy that link into your favorite browser to receive your certificate. And if you miss these links for any reason, or maybe they're not working for you right now, just hang tight. You'll automatically get a follow-up email in a couple days. And in that follow-up email, you'll get a link to the recording, a link to the documents, and a link to the certificate as well. Please feel free to uh, continue the conversation. I know a lot of you were pretty excited about some of the things you learned tonight, so um, feel free to hop on some of these social media outlets. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. And if you're in need of any post-webinar follow-up, uh, maybe after the webinar you have a question or uh, you have a problem with something, feel free to give us a call at 1-800-TI-CARES or send us an email at ti-cares at ti.com. When you leave the webinar tonight, a brief survey will automatically appear in your browser. Your feedback guides us as we plan future online events, so we really hope you'll share your thoughts. Dave, thank you so much for everything tonight. Uh, my head hurts a little bit, uh, but I think that's a good thing. <laughs> so I really appreciate everything you put together. Thanks. And thanks Please. everyone for joining us. Uh, we hope to see you back online real soon. Have a great night. Thank you to all the participants. We appreciate you.